I'm Scott Lachlan, this is the Data Chronicles, and here are your data points. Today's episode is about AI governance. In the data protection world, it seems like it is all AI and really all AI all the time. Businesses are really excited about the promise of AI and lawyers are justifiably nervous. There's seemingly a lot of upside and also a lot of downside at the same time, which has left people shrugging with their palms in the air on charting a path forward. I have not really generally seen the legal community step up with solutions. Instead, the focus within law tends to focus on the risks and all of the many legal issues that AI creates across many legal disciplines. Don't get me wrong, those risks and issues are real, but I feel it's also time to work to solve them. Because whether AI is really the future or whether it's just a flash, clients need to know what to do now to make responsible use of AI. What structures need to be implemented? What systems and roles need to be added? What processes and programs need to be created? Generally, how do we create a governance system around artificial intelligence? To discuss this, I've invited a guest, Kimberly Zink, who is a former chief privacy officer of a large technology company and a longtime privacy pro. Kim, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Scott. I'm excited to be here. So, Kim, as you know, this discussion has its roots in a presentation that you and I planned for DGIQ, which is the Data Governance and Information Quality Conference in December 2023, that you and my partner, James Denville, ultimately led. But I understand that it was a really great conversation and the subject matter was so interesting that I was hoping that we could replicate it on the podcast for all of our listeners. So let's jump right in. And, you know, as I think about where you would start with any type of AI data governance program is really maybe at the starting place, as I see it, is asking the who, what, where, when, how questions. And one of those questions is, what does the landscape look like today with respect to AI law? data protection law as it applies to AI, and where do we see that developing in the short and medium term? Yeah, I think that that's an important place to start. And I think that's where most attorneys naturally would start their analysis is with the law. If you don't mind, just one thing that I like to mention up front is while we are talking about the laws, I think it's critically important for attorneys when they're analyzing the law to always also have in the back of their minds, what are the business objectives for the company for whom they're working? And also, what is the risk appetite of the company so that as you're analyzing the law, instead of just kind of a blank page of thinking about it, you go in with the mindset of the company so that as you're analyzing objectively, you can overlay that with some of the risk-based considerations that every attorney needs to bring to the table. Yeah, I mean, that's a really important point and, and fundamental so that, you know, you are thinking about how to manage the legal obligations while trying to accomplish the business objectives. With AI in particular, I have often found that business objectives are not necessarily so clear. In other words, many organizations see the promise of AI, but have trouble articulating exactly what they would want to do with AI, maybe in the short term, other than perhaps experimentation, research and development, and making it available generally for people to innovate, how the business would like to use AI so that you can then kind of structure things consistent with those goals and objectives. Yeah, and that's an, always an interesting question because as an attorney, one of the first things we want to ask is what, what problem are you bringing to me? What problem are you trying to solve for? Or what are you trying to take advantage of. And just as you said, with AI and and generative AI in particular, it's still really new. And some of the attraction of it is the possibilities that it has and the potential that it has. 
And so when you're talking to the company about it, I, I think that it's the responsibility of an attorney or someone who is leading the, the governance in the AI space to ask really probing questions about what is it that you want to do with this, but also even more importantly is the why in this case. And I think sometimes the why doesn't matter as much, but when we're talking about something like this, I think it does because that helps us then determine how best we can govern the use of AI within an organization. So that I would always, I would start with the why. Yeah, really important. And I think, you know, that often means that there has to be a relationship between the business who is looking for to leverage AI and the legal team who is responsible for solving some of the legal challenges that go along with it. You know, from your perspective, how are you talking about the legal issues that are associated with AI, given that we are find ourselves in a position where there are very few AI specific laws, but we expect more to come. And we do have a number of existing laws, all of which do apply to AI, just like they apply to every other type of activity. So similar to when people started looking at, at privacy, if we analogize that a little bit, then GDPR essentially came out, became a gold standard in the privacy space. And so people use that as the benchmark, even other lawmakers used it as the benchmark for laws that they were creating. In this case, we do have the proposed EU AI Act, which does lay out some foundational principles similar to those in the privacy laws that we're seeing and in GDPR. And start at the principal level and say, what is this law intending to do? Because while it's a draft, we believe it'll stay approximately in the same shape and form, but could be a bit different. So let's take the principles from it and what we believe are the intentions of it, and then overlay what we think those are with the risks that we believe are inherent in the use of AI. And interestingly, with generative AI, we're not just looking at a violation of the law, for example, or fines and penalties associated with that. We're looking at opening up questions around laws that haven't been reevaluated in a long time, like intellectual property law, for example, copyright law. Those are huge unanswered questions. And because the law does not keep up at the pace of business and technology, we're going to find all of the laws, the court cases, enforcement actions, lagging behind governance that we're putting in place for these programs. And so I think it behooves any attorney or executive or individual in IT to take a look at what have we learned in the past about social disruptors, such as the internet, for example. And so cybersecurity wasn't always such a big deal, just like privacy. And so that's what's happening right now with generative AI. So we need to look back at the lessons that we've learned in other similar situations and be cognizant of the very, very, very wide umbrella that generative AI is going to cast over several different laws. Anti-competition, I, I just think there's such an expanse of changes that are going to occur in the legal world because of this. Yeah, I mean, and I, you know, I don't disagree that there's a potential that there's going to be a lot of impact and it's going to require lawyers, compliance professionals, legislators, regulators, all to be thinking creatively, not only about what it is that we have that currently is in place, but also how is it that we are going to try to solve for these, some of these problems. But, you know, I think part of the challenge is that given how broad of an application this could have is that there could be almost a difficulty understanding where to start, right? I kind of said in my preview, it's just like a lot of time focusing on the risk without necessarily spending a lot of time focusing on the solutions. And so you know, I think one place to think about or start is to try to say, how do I start to bring in the right 
team members into this conversation to start developing out a process so that we can get our arms not only around the risks, but then try to sell for them. How do you see that question about where to start and then start to build out a program designed to meet those objectives? Yeah, I completely agree. The place to start is to bring the right people to the table. And the way that I have done that in the past is co-chairing a task force, for example, with the head of governance in IT to bring together the leaders throughout the entire business, create a truly, truly cross-functional task force where the people who are at the table not only are the right people, but they're the people that can make the decisions so that you don't leave those meetings having made decisions that you think were officially made and then having to go back and review them again. And so having a formal task force established first, I think is the place to start so that everyone is being educated at the same time, socializing ideas amongst each other and everyone is part of the process. Everyone can have their voice heard And that brings together so many different viewpoints. You have legal standpoint, IT, all of the business, HR, finance, everyone in the room. And with that, then you have to ask, like we had said before, what are we trying to solve for? Assess for where the company is now. Do we have controls in place right now that we think are helpful in governing the use of generative AI. What I like to do is in building any kind of governance program is to take a look at what exists right now so we don't completely reinvent the wheel. So we take a look at what frameworks exist. There's, for example, the NIST AI framework that that you can use as a starting point to sit down and say, okay, this is what NIST recommends that we have in place. Let's do we as a foundation have these things in place or are there things that aren't applicable or there are additional things that we need to add. And then you can continue to layer on frameworks and standards. So you could layer on ISO standards, for example, because the EUAI Act and presumably other AI laws are going to be principles-based similar to privacy law. You can also look at the EUAI Act itself, but also look at the OECD AI principles, for example. And then on top of that, take a look at what you've already done in the privacy space, I think. So if you have drafted privacy principles, can you pull from those to start to build your guidelines around the use of AI? And so that's the first place that I would start, get the people in the room, come up with your initial framework. And from your perspective, who are the right people to be in the room? You had mentioned kind of at the level of seniority to be able to make decisions. And then I I think I heard you say legal, compliance, IT, other big categories of stakeholders that you would think would want to be part of that conversation in order for the organization to find the right result for them. Yeah, and I think some of those people, for example, software development, if they want to be in the room, they're likely the first people raising their hand asking to use ChatGPT or GitHub Copilot. So there naturally will be people knocking at the door saying, I want to be included in this. And then you have other areas like finance, for example, that might not be top of mind for an organization who's going to be innovative and using something like generative AI. But it's important that they're there, for example, because not only do they hold the purse, but they also actually can use generative AI in some pretty innovative ways. I also like to make sure that people are at the table who have done some curation of data already in the company, because that's one of the biggest risks that we have is that data is going to be inputted that either is it's not controlled, it hasn't been vetted, could be bad data. And if you, you know, garbage in, garbage out, you may get false results if you're putting in bad data. And so having people who've gone through that to help 
provide the lessons learned from that was immensely helpful as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I guess I am also think about the stakeholders as also potentially being project based, right? In other words, we have stakeholders that may be needed for an HR AI solution. And those stakeholders may be different, perhaps than what is needed for a solution that would have a unique application within IT, or they have a unique application within some other functional area, whether that be marketing or research development. And then there are likely to be probably folks who need to be included regardless of the application, data protection folks, you know, legal represented generally, IP being a specific consideration. And you know, I think there will be those main tenants or main people who would always be present within that group. I mean, I guess one question for you, Kim, is then having formed that group, sometimes in my experience, they can get bogged down in the minutia and sometimes necessarily not kind of all going in the right direction and forming the objectives that are needed. From your perspective, how do you address that? And how do you align on a common set of objectives that would be particular to a specific organization? So I think you have to be very direct and upfront with your expectations around what the task force is meant to do. I think coming to the table with some proposals for having the chairs come with proposals for what the objective is, what the timelines are, essentially almost a project plan for the task force itself. Here's what we want to accomplish in meeting one. We want to lay out our vision, our mission, our charter, and all agree on it. In meeting two, we're going to review the top legal risks and trends in meeting three, we're going to do X. And so every meeting has a pre-aligned objective so that you're moving at a regular pace towards governance. And what also happens is some of the churn that I've seen is around use cases, because A lot of the people who are in those meetings have their teams coming to them with use cases. And so what we ended up doing was actually capturing use cases separately. So they were documented. We had a separate sub team reviewing those use cases and reaching back out to the member of the task force who was responsible for that function so that we could keep the task force meetings focused on not what's best for me as a function leader, but what's best for the company from a governance perspective and also from an opportunity perspective. So as part of that, we laid out a grid of what are the highest value innovations that we could have with generative AI and what are the use cases that also are the highest risk. If it's a low risk, high innovation, high likelihood of success, that's what we want to look at first. And so you just start chipping away by using an agreed upon risk matrix, if you will, an ROI and risk matrix to say, these are the ones that we're going to look at first. That could change over time, but that's at least a place that typically people can agree as a good place to start. So you have then identified the technologies that the specific applications that you're going to use with those technologies. How is that team then going to start evaluating specific AI use cases and ultimately coming to a decision or a recommendation about whether a specific technology can be used and how it can be used? So I think if we take a step back They should be part of the task force, but there also should be a team that in parallel is evaluating the technologies. And when we're talking about the technologies, I think we're talking about a few different things. We're talking about what generative AI tools are we going to use? And there's decisions around that that have to be made. Are we bringing in an enterprise version and then training that on our data? If so, which tools are those? Software developers probably want something different than all back to finance or HR, for example, than than finance or HR would want to use. And so I think it's up to the IT leaders initially to think innovatively and forward-looking as to which technologies 
from a generative AI standpoint we want to use. At the same time, we need the legal cybersecurity and IT cybersecurity teams and privacy teams to be evaluating the technologies that we're going to use to secure and provide technical access controls to those technologies. And so all of that is running in parallel with the task force and and the task force is really informed of what's happening within the evaluation space. And that evaluation team is well aware of what's occurring in the task force and providing regular updates at the meetings as to what's happening there. So it's constant, constant communication. And that I think is the bedrock alignment, communication, and clarity on objectives. And so Kim, from your perspective, as you have all of those separate work streams, that coordination, as you said, I think is super important to enable that. What type of documentation and types of artifacts are you creating or the different stakeholders creating to enable the the reporting up or perhaps the ability of sharing what it is that individual work streams have learned and identified during the course of their reviews? So I think overarching, one of the first things a company needs to think about is how are we, and most companies have moved past this point now, but for those that haven't, is how are we going to communicate with a company immediately and upfront as a whole about how to handle publicly available chat of AI, for example. And so what I would recommend is sending out a a company-wide communication with formal guidelines around what you can and can't do with publicly available generative AI tools with a message from, a combined message, I think, from legal and the business and IT saying, we're evaluating all these things. We know there's a lot of innovation here, but please be patient with us because we're working to evaluate what the risks are so that we can proceed as prudently as possible with this. So get out front with your guidelines and then that gives you the time to start building the other documentation, which I would personally include starting with a pretty simple checklist of what do we want to include and in what we're going to call governance. What does governance mean? And what do we need to know? And that's when you start laying out, for example, what is the input? What's the data that I want to use to put into it? Why am I doing this? What's the business justification for it? And also laying out rules around whether or not You have to identify up front whether or not the output, whether something that you're presenting, for example, within the company was a product of generative AI, for example. So watermarking, essentially. And then putting it, and this this is something I personally believe, is putting the onus and the accountability on the user of the tool to lay out what was that input, what was the output, what changed so that it's not compliance or legal or IT who's keeping track of what is everyone at the company doing, but you business, if you want to use it, you need to be accountable for keeping track of this and ensure that they know that it is auditable by compliance, for example. So I think that's where I would start. How do you see those things working out differently if you are both a user of AI or a developer of AI? Do you see the same types of strategies for both or that they would need to be altered in your view? That's an interesting question. So I, I think if you're a developer, I think it's more complicated. For sure, I think there are other responsibilities there, a higher level of accountability if you will, and a lot more explanation and documentation that's needed. As a compliance professional, documentation is critical. We always say, as long as we document how we came up with our decision for how we're going to do something and we can explain it, while a regulator might not agree, they might not be able to say that it's unreasonable though. And I think that that's an important distinction. And so when we're talking about a developer versus 
a user, I think there's probably an entire other code of ethics, if you will, for those developers that would need to be developed. It would almost be two different sets of guidelines. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting, right? Because with the growing number of expectations around the uses of AI, I think one of the areas of documentation that we are now going to all be thinking about is the documentation surrounding like the what we would previously call DPIAs or data protection impact assessments and now AI impact assessments and being able to have the right information to then be able to identify and describe how you're making responsible uses of AI, that you are being cognizant of any inherent biases, that you're kind of addressing issues relating to automated decision-making and all the various considerations that come along with the principles been articulated about AI. Part of the challenge for any user of AI is that they are going to be limited in some ways about how they can respond because they, as a user of an off-the-shelf product, have not been in the position of testing every application of AI to determine whether there is bias or that there is issues relating to accuracy or issues relating to accountability. I mean, all of these things are not going to be clearly present. And as a result, there will have to be some level of cooperation between the developers and the users to be sharing the underlying information around how these tools were developed in order for a user to determine how they can use those tools consistent with that development. I think that that's true. I agree that there's the sort of cloak of invisibility that we have with these tools where a user just taking it off the shelf is by using it, making some kind of assumption that it is safe and that it is ethical. Like you said, I think smaller companies that are using these off the shelf solutions probably don't have the level of maturity or sophistication to be able to further evaluate it. So I think if we're thinking of a a smaller company, I think it would be difficult to put the onus on them in the same way that you would for a large multinational organization, for example. I think those companies have the talent, sophistication, the resources to be able to analyze those tools in different ways that may bring to light some of those issues. More importantly, though, I think is for any company that's using it is that they do their own testing of their outputs to determine whether or not, for example, there is bias. And not only is that a best practice, but we've had this discussion before, there are laws that actually require bias audits for any automated decision making. And so ensuring that a company is cognizant of the risks that are inherent generally in the uses of generative AI and particular to the use cases that they're looking at, I think is critically important. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, the way I kind of often think about this dynamic is there will likely be many more users of AI than there will be developers, but even the developers will probably be using other people's artificial intelligence enabled tools. So in other words, everyone is likely to be a user at some point. And we have seen as data professionals, this movie before. And I think it is something similar to what we've experienced with cybersecurity, whereby whenever it is you engage a processor to be processing your data, their cyber risks become your cyber risks. I think similarly, the vendor's AI risks become the user's AI risks. And so part of a governance process relating to the uses of AI, I think really just needs to be, or a large portion of it, I should say, should really be an enhancement and another chapter in your third-party risk management program, because it's going to be another scenario where users and developers need to be working together in order for the right use cases to be articulated and the right controls implemented at the development stage and at the training data stage in order to avoid 
all of the many harms that people in the community will spotlight. Yeah, I agree. And I think even a, a step further from there, if we're thinking about third party risk management and the vendors, I think there's that offshoot of the relationship with the AI developer vendors that you're using. Then there's also this priority risk, I think, that we have to look at with just with vendors in general that any company is using. Because what we've seen in the past few years is a trend is that most data breaches are occurring at the supplier level. It's the company's data that's being breached, the company that owns the data. It's their data that is being breached, but it's being breached at the supplier level. And so not only is it important to understand any inherent risks from the AI developer vendor, but also what are the risks that we need to be paying attention to from all of our other vendors. We already know that our data is often breached at that level. So I think we need to start evaluating and adding questions to any third-party risk management questionnaires of are you or do you have any intention of using AI with our data? And that question needs to be asked up front, just as many other cybersecurity and privacy questions are asked. And those, I think the onus is on the data owner, so the main company, to ask those vendors really probing questions about potentially what they're going to do with that and often just simply prohibit it. Yeah, I mean, my guess, if I'm predicting the future here, is that we'll see many more like the AI questionnaire similar to people have circulated their cybersecurity questionnaires and we'll have more contractual terms relating to AI than we've ever experienced in the past, but that is probably part of what we all think of a risk management plan that will all feed into our kind of our governance and especially over third-party risks. Kimberly, I really appreciate your time. We only have a couple more minutes, but maybe we can finish by just giving from your perspective, organizations, regardless of their size and maturity, and regardless of whether they have really leaned into this area or not, EQ, from your perspective, any immediate do nows in terms of how they are thinking about AI governance? I think ensuring that the company, that you're communicating with the company about the status of your development of a governance program and controls around it, be open with potential users about the understanding that there is a lot of innovative potential here, but that there are several risks and open up that dialogue with them. I think something that could harm any company is trying to do a lot of this and build this governance behind the scenes where a lot of compliance and governance gets built. (laughs) And so open up the curtain on this one and be much more upfront with what you are doing in that space, because the more that the, the employees understand the risks that are involved, you can avoid some of the early breaches that we've seen, for example, with the Samsung incident that was widely publicized. And so I think awareness, guidelines, and a true dedication with a formal task force to addressing these issues head on with evaluation of use cases, technology, and ensuring that the right people are in the room. Those are all really great practice points, Kimberly. So with that, I really appreciate your joining the podcast and sharing your expertise. And hopefully we'll have you a chance to have you back on the podcast in the future. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. With that, I'm Scott Lachlan. This is the Data Chronicles, and those were your data points.